and I think it will be about page 667. Thank you very much, Diane. Okay. Give you a moment to find that. And I'm going to start reading in a moment from verse 10 of chapter 31 in the book of Proverbs. This has been a favorite passage of mine for many, many years, as long as I can remember. And um, thank you very much, Magda. A beautiful description of the character of a wife. And I've been pondering this uh, over the last 48 hours, and I'm reading it this morning in a completely different way to the way I've ever read it before. And I'm going to lay before you what I think God is saying to us. You test it, what I'm saying, and, uh, and uh, we'll see where we go with this. Okay. Epilogue, the wife of noble character. A wife of noble character, who can find? She is worth far more than rubies. I'll give you a moment to find of it. Some of you are still finding it. It's really worth finding this passage. Proverbs 31 and verse 10. Okay. Here we go. A wife of noble character, who can find? She is worth far more than rubies. Her husband has full confidence in her and lacks nothing of value. She brings him good, not harm, all the days of her life. She selects wool and flax and works with eager hands. She's like the merchant ships bringing her food from afar. She gets up while it is still night she provides food for her family and portions for her women's servants. She considers a field and buys it. Out of her earnings, she plants a vineyard. She sets about her work vigorously. Her arms are strong for her tasks. She sees that her trading is profitable and her lamp does not go out at night. In her hand, she holds the distaff and grasps the spindle with her fingers. She opens her arms to the poor and extends her hands to the needy. When it snows, she has no fear for her household, for all of them are clothed in scarlet. She makes coverings for her bed. She is clothed in fine linen and purple. Her husband is respected at the city gate, where he takes his seat among the elders of the land. She makes linen garments and sells them, and supplies the merchants with sashes. She is clothed with strength and dignity. She can laugh at the days to come. She speaks with wisdom, and faithful instruction is on her tongue. She watches over the affairs of her household, and does not eat the bread of idleness. Her children arise and call her blessed, her husband also, and he praises her. Many women do noble things, but you surpass them all. Charm is deceptive, and beauty is fleeting. But a woman who fears the Lord is to be praised. Honor her for all that her hands have done, and let her works bring her praise at the city gate. This is the word of the Lord. A wife of noble character, who can find her? This wonderful text, probably written by King Solomon, begins with a question. Who can find this woman of noble character? Do you have such a wife, sir? I do. Let me be a whisper. <laughs> <laughs> if you are the husband of such a wife, 
you are truly blessed and and god bless you mightily in that um but i find this very interesting that this question is left hanging in the air who can find her and then we have this description of this idealized wife mother for all these beautiful verses this is what the ideal wife would look like you may know her you may be married to her you may be about to get married to her. wonderful what do you think with you a little bit about wedding dresses i've had lots of encounters with wedding dresses over the probably 100 or so weddings i've taken i remember the occasion when a one bride couldn't get into her wedding dress she was staying over in the bed and breakfast opposite the church and uh, it finally after about half an hour of waiting for the bride to arrive i went over and there she was with her personal tailor who had made the dress two sizes too small and he was literally <laughs> trying to pull her she was a big lady into her white dress um we had the the, the the saga of anna didn't we with her dress was it allowed to be fully white or did it have to have other colors in it that was a great saga wasn't it wendy i've had weddings uh, had a wedding once of a russian lady who arrived at the wedding without her false teeth and um she insisted that her husband went all the way back on a 20 minute drive to get the false teeth which he did the secretary provided tea and coffee for all the guests she came back with the teeth which we couldn't see uh, but she was then happy to get married um there was a there was a vicar in kent not me um who um refused to take a wedding and got onto the front page of the national press because the he felt the dress was um inappropriate for the occasion it was a a strapless evening gown you might have described it as anyway all these things but wedding dresses what the white wedding dress is hugely important isn't it in our culture and i've been thinking about what does this symbolize and what is it about um i i i suspect at some level it's a desire for perfection it's a longing for the very greatest highest possible ideal of being a wife uh that you you can lay hold of it's an ideal that in our culture we really value this white wedding dress that you're expected to dress up in huge sums of money is going into this and i want to suggest to you that this puts the the woman who's about to get married under a huge pressure she has to be a superstar glamorous wonderful person on this occasion but something in there or that's putting it rather negatively but i suggest that something in there in our culture the white dress symbolizes a longing for perfection a longing for the very very best on this important day when husband and wife man and woman become one Jesus said in the sermon on the mount be perfect as your father in heaven is perfect but our english language uh doesn't really get the meaning of that very well because uh, a few hundred years ago we would have been able to say it beautifully but now we've lost the the, the ability to communicate this and translate this accurately because when jesus said be perfect he wasn't speaking to one person he was using the plural he wasn't say be thou perfect o nigel he was saying to everybody collectively be perfect together that's the ideal it's something we lay hold of as a community of faith individually you cannot get close to perfection but together when we travel together as disciples of Jesus Christ we can become moved towards perfection so back to this passage let's have a look at it 
Let's have a look at the virtues of this idealized wife. Yeah? She brings, uh, she selects wool and flax and works eagerly with her hands. I know some of you are very good with uh, that kind of work. She uh, is like the merchant ships bringing her food from afar. I know that some of you are extremely um, industrious. She gets up while it is night and provides food for her family and portions for all her women servants. Some of you are like that. But those of you who are like that probably aren't very good at buying fields and selling it and out of your earnings planting vineyards. Mm -hmm. Going on, uh, she, in verse 18, she's still trading here and her lamp doesn't go out at night. This is a real industrious uh, uh, trading woman who is a brilliant businesswoman. Right? And then uh, in verse 19, she's spindling, she's how do you say it, weaving yarn. Verse 20, we find her opening her arms to the poor and reaching out hands to the needy. Some of you do that, but not all of you have time to do that, as well as spinning yarn, being a, a businesswoman, and cooking brilliant food. Yeah? And so it goes on like this. Yeah? Verse 24, she makes garments and sells them, supplies them with uh, uh, sashes. Uh, she watches, verse 27, she watches over the household, of her, uh, the affairs of her household, and does not eat the bread of idleness. She's hard working. Her children arise and call her blessed. Do all your children arise and call you blessed? I don't remember my children ever <laughs> telling Margareta that. So what I'm getting at is this. In our, uh, any community of faith that is growing, developing well together, you will find some who are really good at one thing, aspect of this, and others who are not so good at that particular aspect, right? You would have to go very far to surpass the cuisine of our Magda. How many of us can cook as well as Magda? Very few of us. <laughs> Sorry to embarrass you, Magda. But... Um, how many of you would be uh, as good business women? I, who's a good business woman here? Some of you. Aha! Brother Lowe's wife. Good business woman. Yeah? How many of you have a great big heart for the poor and go out to the poor? I know some of you do that sort of thing. Okay. Do you see where I'm going with this? So in that sense, you might like to think of all the different virtues of this idealized wife of noble character as like pieces of a jigsaw puzzle. Each of you make up a different piece in the jigsaw puzzle. And when that jigsaw puzzle is complete, what do we see? We see the face of the bride of Christ, which is us. Together, we form the bride of Christ. And who is the bridegroom? The scriptures, both old and new, tell us that the bridegroom is Jesus. And he loves us with an undying love. He loves us collectively. Why? Because we are his bride. So this description here of this idealized wife, in an allegorical sense, is us. It is us. It is the church of Jesus Christ. It was Israel and her God, Yahweh. Now it is us, the church, the bride of Christ. And our bridegroom who looks at us is Jesus. Now one of the other favorite passages I have in the scriptures that ties in with this is from Song of Songs. And again, I often read this at wedding services. I'm looking at chapter 2 and verses 11 to 13. The Song of Songs is a love poem where he and she, lover and beloved, speak to one and each other. And here we read in verse 11 of chapter 2 of Song of Songs, see the winter is past, the rains are over and gone. Flowers appear on the earth, 
The season of singing has come. The cooing of doves is heard in our lands. The winter is past. So, for me, that is saying this morning that the struggle for the individual woman to be the perfect woman, the glamorous, beautiful bride dressed in white, that pressure is over. Because the vision is that together we become the bride of Christ. We cannot get there alone. So if you have a look at Ephesians 5, this is where the imagery comes out so beautifully in chapter 5 of Ephesians and verse 25. This is the, the passage where the writer is speaking about how husbands are to relate to their wives and wives to their husbands. And you'll notice that the writer moves from that, husband and wife, very quickly to the relationship between the bride of Christ, the church, and her saviour, her bridegroom, Jesus. Husbands, love your wives just as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her, to make her holy, cleansing her by the washing with water through the word, and to present her to himself as a radiant church without stain or wrinkle or any other blemish, but holy and blameless. Do you see what happens here? He starts thinking about wives and husbands, but immediately he shifts over to the bride, the bride of Christ, us, the church. And God's aim is not just to take individuals, but to take all of us as the bride and get rid of all the spots and wrinkles and blemishes and disformities that we have collectively. When Jesus looks at us now, he sees a spotty bride. (laughs) He sees a spotty bride. He sees stuff, work that's got to be done. But as the perfect one, the one without sin, Jesus, the bridegroom, is poised to make us whole and clean. That's the scriptural vision. Okay. So I think we need to say no to the contemporary image of the super bride, the super woman. We need to say no to imagining that this description of the wife of noble character is actually realizable. I don't believe it is. If such a wife is here present or you know of one, I'd like to meet her. Right? We need to say to know all of that to all of that, and we need to lay hold of the biblical vision that it's together, in community, alongside one another, that we begin to move towards perfection. Be perfect, Jesus says. Not just one of us, but be perfect collectively together. It's tough. It's a long journey. And to understand why it's such a tough transition to make, it's not a bad idea to go back to Genesis and the first woman and Genesis 3 and see what the consequence of Eve's and Adam's rebellion was. Genesis chapter 3. And the scripture tells us here that Eve, Eve is the mother of all the living. We're all offspring of Eve. And what happens to all, has happened to all of us is the consequence of Eve's rebellion together with Adam. So have a look at Genesis 3 and verse 16. Here is the consequence of her rebellion. I will make your pains in childbearing very severe. With pain you will give birth to children. Your desire will be for your husband, and he will rule over you. The torment of many women through the centuries has been that they desire their husband, they love him, They're drawn to him, they yearn for him, they need him, but then when they come to be with him, so often 
that husband, that man, rules over the woman. And it has been, it's been millennia of male exploitation of women. Margaret has showed me uh, Desmond Tutu's own personal recollection as a child, what his dad did to his mother. We are all heirs of the consequences of Adam and Eve's rebellion, heirs of the consequences of the sin of the Garden of Eden. And so there's a lot of, a lot of healing that needs to take place. And again, I come back to it, the healing needs to be in the body, in us as a group of people all traveling together. There's a lot of spots to be removed. There's a lot of brokenness to be put right. But it's in traveling together that we begin to move towards that perfection that God wants for us. Have a look at 1 Peter 3. I began this service with some verses from 1 Peter. 1 Peter, Peter uh, 3, and verses 2 to 4. Here's a, a, a glimpse of the kind of woman God calls you to be and the kind of bride God collectively calls us to be. But look, read in verse 3 here of 1 Peter, or verse 2, 1 Peter 3 and verse 2. When they see your purity and the reverence of your lives, your beauty, verse 3, should not come from outward adornment such as elaborate hairstyles and the wearing of gold and golden jewelry and fine clothes. That's the outer person, the outer woman. Rather, verse 4, it should be that of your inner self, the unfading beauty of a gentle and quiet spirit, which is of great worth in God's sight. For this is the way the holy women of the past who put their hope in God used to adorn themselves. So, let's let go of the white dress and the idealized, glamorous woman, the superstar model. And let's lay hold of what Peter is saying here. The, the real holiness and the real progress is made in the inside of the person, the inner holiness. We don't need all the jewelry. I actually don't have any problem if people put jewelry on. <laughs> but we, that's not what it's about. It's about the inner holiness, the inner purity. And that applies to our women, but it applies to us as the bride. We are a bride, the bride of Christ. So it's the inner holiness that God is looking for, and that is the progress we are called to make together alongside one another. Okay. We're going to be going off, a lot of us, to Letton Hall very soon. More about that in a minute when Lee shows us some pictures of it. Um, we've been working with uh, David Halford, who's going to be leading the, the uh, weekend. And together we came up with a title uh, yesterday uh, for the weekend, How Then Shall We Live? How then shall we live? What kind of lives do we want to have? And one of the things we're going to be looking at together is how to affirm each other's strengths. So it won't be difficult to say that weekend, Magda, we love your food. <laughs> yeah? You are a wife who has, it must be great sitting at Magda's tables at home, <laughs> uh, eating that food. But we want to say also to the unsung heroes, um, we love your gifts too. Because without your gifts, and they sometimes might be hidden quiet gifts, without your gifts, uh, we were are not a complete bride. We are not completely the bride of Christ. Yeah? So some gifts are very obvious and beautiful and on the table, if you like. But other ones are hidden and quieter, but of equal value. And that, then, is how I'm now choosing to read this passage of Proverbs. I don't think it's possible 
I, th I think the answer to King Solomon's question, a wife of noble character, who can find her? I think my answer is no, that doesn't exist. And the scriptural answer in the trajectory of the whole of the Bible is that we become that together. We become the wife, the bride of noble character. To the point, yeah, that we, God is able to say of us, and he says it of us now, but 1, 1 Peter 2 and verse uh, 9, the words I began the service with, you are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's special possession, that you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his wonderful light. That's interesting, because before the service when we were praying together, one person had a picture of a person in a royal kind of robe, purple robe. That's us, together. Yeah? And then the, the, the verse goes on, verse 10 here. Once you were not a people, but now you are the people of God. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. So that flies in the face, that vision flies in the face of the dominant message of our culture, which is we want glamorous supermodels, we want superstar w mothers and wives, yeah? We want uh, that, that, that kind of whole individualistic struggle for perfection. We say no to that, and we say, actually, I cannot become full, I cannot become complete without Jonathan, without Andrew, without Ted, without Diane. I cannot be complete in the, my place in the bride of the body of Christ, the bride of Christ, without any of you. I'm just struggling impotently to make progress. But together with you, I become a piece in the jigsaw alongside you and all those pieces, you, when put together beautifully, what do they form? The face of the beautiful bride that God has called us to come. Jesus looks at it, looks at us, and he loves us. That's the good news for us today. Will you run with that? Good. Amen. Right.